You're now on the historic route. Today, the metal beasts of Villa Bretonneur. April 24th, 1918, the Western Front. Heavy fighting has reduced the area around the town of Villa Bretonneur to a desolate wasteland. The once green, lush countryside of northern France has turned into a mix of moon craters and sprawling bogs. What little remains of the once numerous collection of trees, shrubbery, and the like now slowly suffocates under an unending wall of heavy fog. But this fog is different. It's man-made. Parts gunpowder smoke, parts smoke from the never-ending fires, and, of course, parts gas, like mustard gas and tear gas. This hellscape is now home to the countless dead that left their lives for king and country, their sacrifice made manifest through their inaudible screams, crying for vengeance, victory, or just peace. Deafening artillery barrage, the reply they get, as yet more men prepare to join their fallen comrades in death. But man isn't alone in this infernal soup of death and madness. Something stalks these haunted battlegrounds. A beast, a Leviathan, a hulking steel giant, patrols the wastes. Its terrifying groaning, warped and alien, reaches across the trenches. It's coming closer. Its grotesque visage penetrates the fog and emerges, revealing its true nature. A tank, a panzer, a metal beast of Villa Bretonneur. The tank. Doesn't actually need an introduction, right? I mean, almost no other vehicle captures the imagination quite like the tank. And everybody has their own image of them. Be it the German blitzkrieg, Soviet symbol of suppression, or maybe the war in Iraq. The main point being, the tank does it all. So how did this trench-clearing machine turn into a battlefield mainstay? Because, yes, that was the original idea behind the tank. Some big metal box that you can cross a trench with. Much like a Roman shield wall with wheels, if you want to think of it like that. But I don't want to talk too much about the origin of the tank idea itself. I want to talk about how this, let's say, tool with a specific purpose became the militarized jack-of-all-trades we know today. And to skip ahead a bit, in my opinion, this transformation can be traced back to a little engagement that happened in April 24th, 1918. The Battle of Villa Bretonneur. Okay, here's a tiny bit of backstory as to where in time and space we are right now. It's the end of the Great War, April 1918. And the German army has just launched their infamous spring offensive against Allied positions in the north of France. Their forces bolstered by the eastern troops transferred from the now calm Russian front. Calm because of the recent Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which removed the Tsardom from the war and left it to disintegrate from within. Okay, so Germans are launching this massive last-ditch attempt to turn the tide of the war in their favor. And they are throwing everything they have at their enemies including tanks. And let me tell you, these are not at all like the German tanks of the Second World War. These were moving pillboxes. These A7Vs, as they were called, looked like, well, 
They looked like moving toasters with guns sticking out the sides. I, I really encourage you to look them up. It's quite the look. And they look nothing like you would imagine a tank to look like. But remember, they were made for one purpose and one purpose only. Shielding the troops inside in their attempt to cross no man's land and then the enemy trench. And the Germans weren't the only ones with tanks, of course. The French and obviously the British, the original inventors of the vehicle, had them too. I'll skip talking about the French today as their tanks won't feature in this battle, but as a side note, the French Renault FT-17 was in terms of quality and sales the most successful World War I tank. But we need to talk about the British here. Their primary tank was the Mark IV medium tank. And should you already have an image of early tanks or World War I tanks in your head, well, that's the tank you're thinking of. So, the Mark IV, this elongated metal bunker with tracks, it came in two variants, male and female. Almost to be expected, the male variant had big six-pounder guns, and the female variant had light machine guns equipped. But both variants had proven themselves quite capable since their introduction in 1916 at the Battle of the Somme. Okay, so now that we have some background info, let's get into what exactly happened at Villa Bretonneux. As I mentioned before, the assault on the town was part of the German Spring Offensive. So it was the Kaiser's men who fired the first shots in this battle here. And quite typical for the time, the Germans begun this battle by shelling the enemy's trenches with artillery fire and mustard gas shells. This was done in order to soften up the defenses of your foes. And soften up they did. You know, it's a common misunderstanding that uh, gas or maybe machine guns were the big killer in World War I, when in fact it was artillery that did most of the harm. Now, don't get me wrong, gas and especially machine guns did a horrendously good job at ending human lives, but nothing quite compared to the devastation artillery caused in the Great War battles. And I think before we continue... It's important to me that we dwell a bit longer on how truly terrible these battles really were. You know, it's easy to get caught up in grand strategy, technical marvels, or heroic actions of soldiers, but I believe we have to ground these discussions in a true understanding of the awful toll on human life the Great War and war more generally caused. Let's say you're a British soldier here in Villa Bretonne. Although this could be said of almost every soldier on almost every side, but I'll take a British one here as an example. So you're a British soldier here in this French town. You spend most of your time underground in a small earthen hole, not much bigger than yourself, supported only by shaky wooden beams. The ground is riddled with mice and rats almost as riddled as your hair is with lice and other bugs. The chances are high that you have trench foot, a rotting of the feet caused by long-time exposure to damp conditions. Day in and day out, the pounding of shells shakes the ground. Explosions on a regular basis have rendered you near death. Your right hand is always close to your hip, where your gas mask rests. See, at any moment now, one of your comrades could yell out, Gas! 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 And you would scramble to put it on. Oh, and should you be so lucky, and there is a short cessation of fire, you're now instead treated to the sounds of the dying, moaning in no man's land, begging for release. And yet you are powerless to do anything. Because if you do try to go out and help them, you most likely will only join them. And if all this is uncomfortable to listen to, good, because it shouldn't be comfortable. This was as close to hell as you could get. And at this point in the war, 1918, the soldiers were at their breaking point. 
At this point, French high command was actually more scared of a soldier's revolt than the German attack, with soldiers reportedly refusing to fight anymore and just sit and wait in their trench. You know, it was just madness, and it, it made people fighting there mad. So continue looking through the eyes of one of these British soldiers on this day, April 24th, 1918. The unending German wave of shells and gas has caused a thick, suffocating mist to develop all around the battlefield. And then it happens. The firing ceases. And through the mist you can make out the clanking and deep humming of enemy tanks. A red devil emerges from the misty soup. Now, this devil is just part of the graffiti German soldiers have painted on one of their tanks, aptly named Mephisto. But for all intents and purpose, this is the devil, coming straight for you, followed by more devils with names such as Nixe or Wotan. All German A7V tanks heading for your trench. But if those are devils, then you have angels on your side. Two female and one male Mark IV emerge from the right over your trench and steam towards the enemy. Now, this may seem like these English tanks were dispatched to counterattack the German tank assault, but this wasn't actually the case. Like I said, tank versus tank combat wasn't really a thing yet. No, these tanks were actually sent out to assault the German trenches, much like the German tanks were sent out to assault the English trenches. And this meeting of the metal beasts was entirely not on purpose. So these early tanks were not designed to fight other tanks at all. Yet the British tank commander here, Lieutenant Frank Mitchell, made the fateful decision to engage the foe anyway. And the Germans, under 2nd Lieutenant Wilhelm Biltz, responded in kind. And so it begins, the first ever tank battle, in the midst of a hellish landscape, Germans versus English, and all of it pretty much accidental. Nixe builds his tank, opens fire on the Mark IVs, its 57mm main gun tearing holes in the two female tanks. They respond with machine gun fire, but Nixe's hull proves impervious to bullet damage. Damaged and realizing that they're outgunned, Mitchell orders the two females to retreat. Now, Mitchell, seated in the remaining male Mark IV, focuses his fire on Nixa as the other two A7Vs position left them still out of range. Biltz's tank fires back. But both commanders quickly realize that staying on the move decreases their chance of getting hit. So both vehicles start circling each other, firing on the move. Both designs are woefully inadequate at firing on the go, so no hits are scored. Mitchell, in order to halt this stalemate, stops his tank in an advantageous position and fires both of his six-pounders on Nixa. Score! Score! Biltz's tank is severely hit and starts slipping in the mud, causing it to tilt. Smoke emerges from the chassis. The German position seems untenable. Biltz and his men decide to leave their vehicle behind and try to run for cover in their trench. But Mitchell had been expecting that. He trains his machine gun on them and starts mowing them down, killing half of them, nine out of eighteen men. And yes, tank crews had to be pretty big back then. So after the last of Nix's crew had either escaped or been killed, the two other German A7Vs reached the melee. Mitchell repositioned himself and opened fire on both of them. A similar dance developed, like the one we saw Mitchell and Biltz doing. No one really scoring hits. Then the Germans started sending their infantry. Standard tactics always dictated a tank spearhead and an infantry assault afterward. Just this time, the tanks hadn't gotten past Mitchell's Mark IV yet. So now you had German infantry out in the open. Quickly realizing the situation and the very real possibility of being surrounded by both tanks and infantry, Mitchell started retreating. But he continued firing at the tanks and also at the infantry, using canister shot to drive them off. Canister shot is like using shotgun pellets, but with a cannon. A bloodbath ensued with uncounted German casualties. Both 
A7Vs were now closing fast on the British tank, and an encirclement was imminent. This most definitely looked like the end for Mitchell and his remaining crew. I say remaining because this toxic soup they were fighting in had slowly been taking its toll on the crew. Only four of his original eight-man team were still alive at this point. Truly, this seemed like the inevitable end. And here is where history pulls one of its stranger-than-fiction moments for which it's so notorious. Out of nowhere, like in an epic fantasy movie, British reinforcements arrive. In his darkest moment, when all seemed lost, Mitchell noticed seven new light Whippet tanks cruising into view. The Whippet tank, a late-war British tank design, much more reminiscent of modern tanks, whereas early tanks were made to overcome and breach enemy lines, more modern tanks, like the Whippet, were produced to fill the gap cavalry had left behind at the beginning of the war. The Whippet, much like the cavalry of old, were utilized in such a way as to exploit gaps in enemy defenses, chase down retreating foes, and generally perform raiding duties. So, back to the story. There Mitchell is, in the middle of this heated engagement, surrounded and battered, when these light tanks arrive, like the cavalry charge of old, storming down the hill in a glorious charge, this time, though, carried by the power of engines, gas, and electricity, not horses. This clanking agglomeration of mechanical death in the form of seven tanks provided enough covering fire for Mitchell and his crew to slowly start moving their tank out of harm's way. The relative speediness of the Whippet tanks allowed them to maneuver around quite quickly, even fast enough to actually run down German soldiers, with one combatant later describing the tank treads of those Whippet tanks as consistently, quote, covered with blood. This easy maneuverability came at a cost of armor, though. Out of those seven tanks, four were quite quickly disabled or destroyed by German fire. The remaining whippets, along with Mitchell and his tank, started to retreat to safety. Being badly hit, while also the heaviest and by default slowest moving tank, Mitchell and crew started to lag behind the rest of the retreating tanks exposing them once again to German fire. With their worst fears now being realized, a German mortar shall hit one of their tracks, completely disabling it. Just try to imagine this situation, this scene. You're stuck in a cramped, hot, gas and smoke-filled metal coffin, along with four alive and four dead crew members, all the while being pounded non-stop with German small and heavy arms fire. And now you're stuck too, with no way of getting the tank moving again. What do you do? Staying inside surely would spell out certain death for you and your comrades. But exiting? No man's land and its endless craters, smoke, gas, barbed wire, mines, fires, mud pits, wooden spikes, debris, dead men, machine gun fire, handgun fire, grenades, bombs and more, isn't exactly the place you want to run across unprotected. And add to those ever-present threats the fact that you have this section of the German army actively firing at you and your position. Well, what can I say? Quite the pickle for Mitchell and Co. to get out of. But try they do. The remaining crew members of the by now completely out of order Mark IV exit their vehicle and dash for their side of the trench works. Dodging all fire, what is by most accounts a more than miraculous feat, all of them make it back to their trench, to the sheer awestruck faces of their comrades back in their trench. Mitchell and his remaining men were saved, and the first ever tank battle in history had just come to a dramatic end. Now, the Battle of Villa Bretonneur, and so actually also the story, doesn't really completely end there. See, this entire section of the front will still see many skirmishes and battles before the war moves away from that area. 
In one of those battles, Wilhelm Biltz, the German tank commander, who actually was part of the men who escaped Mitchell's fire, actually led a salvage operation to reclaim his tank Nixe. Ultimately failing, but still it shows how vital these tanks were perceived to be. If a rescue operation were launched in order to recover them, surely they were worth it. And this incentive motive only increased by the fact that the German Empire's production capability was stretched so far thin that every piece of equipment counted for double its value. All in all, the time for the German tank was yet to come, but you can still see sort of signs of where it was to go. And that brings me to, I think, the interesting question in this whole affair. What did everyone take away from this, the first ever tank battle? Well, maybe that question is a bit unfitting, as it's quite hard to pinpoint major shifts in tactical thinking on one small engagement, but nonetheless I will try to answer the question, while I bid everyone to keep in mind that these post villa Bretonneur after-effects are more broadly just a part of post-World War I after-effects. So what are the big takeaways? Let's look at the British first. In their eyes, the battle and the war itself vindicated their design choices and their strategy in using tanks. The idea of having one bigger and more powerful main tank model and also a lighter, faster model rooted itself deep into British war planning. When World War II rolls around and the English go to war yet again, we can see them employing this dual model approach with their use of heavier tanks such as the Mathilda or Churchill and lighter tanks such as the Crusader. This tank dogma would shift though in the later years of that conflict, giving way to the idea of the main battle tank design, a topic for another time. Overall, British strategy in the world of tanks stayed continuous and true to their roots. More interesting is what the Germans took away from all this. They completely shifted away from their A7V thinking of battles past. They embraced speed and the re-embodied spirit of cavalry in the form of mechanized warfare. You see, in their eyes, World War I's elimination of the role of cavalry had brought forth all the terrible stalemates that produced all the horrors I have described in trench warfare. If only tank designs like the Whippet could be brought to their natural conclusion, cavalry could have a rebirth in machine form. Reassuming the role they had always played, lightning fast reconnaissance, exploitation, and storm tactics. Blitzkrieg, in other words, or at least that is what it came to be called. Although this style of warfare was the norm for most of human warfare. Actually, World War I was the outlier here, and not World War II and subsequent wars. So at the same time, the French armies accepted the death of cavalry, and started to embrace what they thought modern warfare was going to look like, the best examples being the use of the Maginot Line. The Germans went ahead and tried to resuscitate the spirit of cavalry in the form of the tank. Two different takeaways from this war. Villa Bretonneux. Human bravery meets machinated slaughter. Much like a primordial soup, this place brought all manners of strange new life in the form of ideas and machines to bear. And the hellish crucible that was the Western Front, creatures such as the Mark IV or the A7 Re thrived and died together their flesh and blood masters perishing all around them in the never-ending struggle for bits of by now worthless land. And out of this struggle, emerging from this soup for the first time on dry land, was something new, an idea, a sharpened tool, an evolved beast. The Tank. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Please join me next time on The Historic Route. Thank you.